Thanks a lot, Keith. Um, so um, I was afraid that what I came up with to say could end up being too short. So before I actually begin, I just want to um, just start with some impressions, uh, kind of loose impressions of contemporary culture to frame what I'm going to say in my more official remarks. So um, a few years ago, I was in a, a supermarket and I swiped my bank card to pay for my groceries. And uh, so, you know, there's the little screen where you, uh, the punch, you know, pad where you, you key in your PIN number and you wait a couple seconds and you confirm the amount. And there's like two or three steps like that. Um, well, during the, while I was doing that, it became clear that some person had realized that uh, a person in that situation is a captive audience because mm -hmm. during those intervals, I was shown advertisements on the little screen, which I couldn't help but stare at. And the intervals themselves, I had previously assumed were just some artifact of the communication technology, but I now realize that these were uh, something more deliberately calibrated. These haltings now served somebody's interest. And that's when it really hit me that a, um, a new frontier of capitalism has been opened up by our self-appointed disruptors. And it's one where the point seems to be to dig up and monetize every bit of private headspace. If you ride the bus in Seoul, South Korea, um, you, there's, a, there's a smell resembling that of Dunkin' Donuts coffee that's released into the ventilation system of the bus whenever um, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts jingle plays over the sound system. And this happens just as the bus is pulling up outside a Dunkin' Donuts store. And the, uh, the driver points out the fact, in case you somehow missed it. <laughs> there remain many areas for further progress. Um, the homework, report cards, permission slips, and other minor communications that a teacher sends home with students are in many school districts still blank on the back. So here is a gross offense against the efficient use of space. Um, but there's at least one forward-thinking school district in Massachusetts that now sells advertising space on the backs of these slips of paper. Oh, no. And I learned that from the Colbert Report. Um, <laughs> you almost have to be a comedian, I think, to wrap your head around uh, contemporary culture. So with that as a, as a backdrop to sort of turn to liberal education proper, the word education is based on a Latin root that means to lead out. I think it could be taken to mean being led out from one's youthful preoccupations and untutored affections. Liberal education implies liberation from the present, I think. We touched on this last night. The present with its necessarily partial view of what's important and its peculiar sly ways of making us unfree in thought. I think if I was going to um, address myself to a young person about this, I would start with a, a fairly harsh speech and say that without liberal education, you'll merely repeat the opinions of journalists, however much they may feel like your own discoveries. I'd say that the first step in such education is to discover how impoverished in thought and feeling you are. Open yourself to the full human experience as conveyed by the great works, and develop a corollary contempt for your contemporaries. Later, you'll be embarrassed by this contempt that you felt as a young man or woman. But there's no intellectual discernment without keenly felt judgment. Education is an iterated process of giving oneself over to admiration and contempt directed to their proper objects as best you can make them out, and later suffering the humiliations that come when you're corrected by teachers more discerning than you. The reward comes in the cumulative effect of this process, which is that you come to see things more clearly. And this is pleasurable 
think education is the highest form of hedonism. <laughs> but it competes with other less demanding pleasures. As Don Cohen pointed out in the, uh, the article that we talked about last night, the spirit of learning is at odds with the spirit of entertainment. And this gets to the peculiar challenge of liberal education in our cultural moment. We're living through a crisis of attention, I think, a widespread sense of mental fragmentation. We often feel that our attention isn't simply ours to direct as we will, because it's subject to mechanized appropriation. And this can feel like a crisis of self-ownership. At its worst, it may cause you to wonder if you're going to be able to maintain a coherent self. I mean a self that's able to act according to settled purposes and ongoing projects, rather than flitting about. We generally attribute this problem to technology, but I think it has deeper cultural roots. Our distractibility seems to indicate that we're agnostic on the question of what is worth paying attention to, that is, what to value. To answer this question freely requires shelter, a space for seriousness that has to be carved out resolutely against the noise. Um, and I expect Diana might say something about that later. So when I was in grad school in the 90s, um, I'd sometimes spend 10 or even 12 hours at the library, getting up from my chair really only to get some food once in a while from the cafeteria. The internet um, was a relative novelty. This is sort of mid-90s. And email was something that you had to go to a special room to do. You know, it was the room with networked computers. The same room where you could print out a draft of whatever paper you were working on. Checking my email while the printer churned was always um, kind of exciting because I might have one or two. <laughs> <laughs> Back at my apartment, I think my TV got five channels. Now I open a book of Greek philosophy, the same stuff I was into 20 years ago, and try to read. <clears throat> After half a page, I find I'm sort of shifting my weight in the chair and drumming my fingers on the table. And then I realize it is Tuesday night after all, and Sons of Anarchy is on. <laughs> so I turn that on. By the way, I think um, um, Diane last night in her talk, as, as wise as she is, she was wrong about one thing. Um, namely, TV has, has gotten awesome. <laughs> It's far better than anything that was on in 1960. I mean, talking about the sort of prestige, the good stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a problem. Um, so I turn on Sons of Anarchy and share the experience with 4.6 million of my closest friends. And maybe this is for the best, because the next day I have some basis for chit-chat with others. I'm not a freak. In grad school, I felt disconnected from the surrounding culture. I basically missed the 90s. I have no idea what happened. Um, but now I like to think I'm pretty hip. If I'd gotten absorbed in Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics last night, my head would still be turning in a spiral of untimely thoughts that could only sound strange to my acquaintances. So if my experience is typical, what it means is that we're becoming more similar to one another. There would seem to be a large cultural consequence to our ability to concentrate on things that aren't immediately engaging, or a lack of such ability, and that is the persistence of intellectual diversity, or not. To insist on the importance of trained powers of concentration, is to recognize that independence of thought and feeling is a fragile thing and requires certain conditions. One thing that distinguishes human beings from other animals is that we are evaluative creatures. We can take a critical stance toward our own activities and aspire to direct ourselves toward objects and projects that we judge to be more worthy than others that may be 
be more immediately gratifying. Animals are guided by appetites that are fixed, and so are we. But we can also form a second order desire, a desire for a desire. When we entertain some picture of the sort of person we would like to be, a person who is better not because she has more self-control, but because she is moved by worthier desires. Acquiring the tastes of a serious person is what we call education. A few years ago, I visited Las Vegas, which is a place that's designed for the single purpose of separating you from your money. <laughs> the female form is used quite freely there in advertisements. They bombard you from the moment you step off your airplane. These images work just as surely as tying a rope to a person's neck and giving it a sharp yank. The point, of course, is to pull you into a casino or some other money pit. Once the initial excitement wears off, you start to feel like a rat in a city-sized experiment in social engineering. Nothing subtle, no feeling that isn't industrial strength in its urgency and standardized in its appeal can arise in such a ruthlessly monetized attentional environment. And here the nudgers are not government bureaucrats, but those who would monetize our attention. And by the way, <clears throat> the ownership of casinos in the 90s passed from the mob to Wall Street investors. Now, of course, Vegas is an extreme case. But more generally, advanced economies are said to be moving away from producing goods or even delivering services in favor of creating experiences. And this necessarily relies on techniques for attracting and holding attention. Life is increasingly saturated with representations crafted for this purpose, from video games to porn to carefully curated ecotourism adventures. And we can view Vegas as a kind of laboratory where the, the cutting edge of these dark arts is being honed. The alternative would be to reclaim the real as against manufactured experiences. This happens when we immerse ourselves in skilled practices that make real demands on us and bring us into face-to-face -face contact with others. Cooking, playing sports, playing music together, building things, fixing things. Activities like these establish um, what I call ecologies of attention that can help us overcome the mental fragmentation of contemporary culture. In light of the satisfactions they provide, the thin pleasures of manufactured experiences may come to seem pale counterfeits and lose some of their grip on us. We may find ourselves free to think once again. So um, I have a, a new book in which I present case studies of, of these ecologies of attention, um, cases including that of a short order cook, hockey players, uh, people who build musical instruments, and uh, it's interesting stuff, I think. If you think I've gotten something right in my description of our cultural moment, it means we have to revisit the question of liberal education. The medieval distinction was between the liberal arts and the servile arts. The former are those befitting a free person. The latter are those that someone who's less than free is condemned to practice. They were also called the mechanical arts. And this made perfect sense. You learned the mechanical arts uh, out of necessity to win your bread. The liberal arts required leisure, hence wealth, which was an accident of birth. But I think that um, without stretching the term too much or too perversely, we can think of the liberal arts also as um, the arts by which you secure your freedom. What they consist of uh, will then depend on where the threats to freedom lie, or better, where the forces that tend to degrade our most humane capacities lie. 
If I'm right about the role of skilled practices, and indeed the mechanical arts, in gathering our mental energies, it means that they have a special role to play, a liberal role, in a culture of distraction. So we may, need, we may need to reconsider the categories of liberal arts and servile arts, and with them the distinction between liberal, liberal education and vocational <coughs> education. There's a woodshop teacher named Doug Stowe, who wrote, uh, he writes very eloquently about his, his work as a shop teacher, and he wrote that in schools we create artificial learning environments for our children that they know to be contrived and undeserving of their full attention and engagement. Without the opportunity to learn through the hands, the world remains abstract and distant, and the passions for learning will not be engaged. So um, elsewhere, I, you know, I had, my first book was about, it was making a case for the skilled trades, really based on um, claim and an insight about how cognitively rich and demanding that work can be to try to kind of um, show that it can be a life that's worth choosing. So um, I guess one sort of concrete thought I'll leave you with is um, that of apprenticeship. So um, uh, you know, just by a point of comparison, in, in, in Germany, uh, which has a very different culture about education and work than we do, it's, it's over 50%, I think it's closer to 60% of 16-year-olds enter an apprenticeship program. And that's a place where a smart and aspiring 16-year-old um, might imagine himself becoming, let's say, a prototype machinist at Mercedes-Benz. And that's a respectable aspiration to have. Uh, here in the States, apprenticeship is often criticized for being too narrow in education. It's often said that what the economy demands are um, workers who are flexible, um, as, uh, almost as though they shouldn't be burdened with any particular set of skills or knowledge, but just um, sort of be fully pliable material that can be shaped <laughs> into whatever is required. But I think it bears thinking about that when you go deep, into some particular skill or art. It trains your powers of concentration and perception. You become more discerning about these particular objects, whatever they may be. And if all goes well, you get initiated into an ethic of caring about what you're doing. Um, and that's usually by the example of some particular person, some mentor who embodies that spirit of craftsmanship. So what I'm trying to say is that technical education, though it's um, certainly narrow in its immediate application, can be understood as part of education in the broadest sense, and that is um, intellectual and moral formation. Thank you. understandable to people who don't speak five languages. <laughs> Dr. Diana Sinishaw was introduced to the Dallas Institute through Dr. Diane Ravitch in 2010 when she came to speak at the first education forum. Dr. Ravitch told Dr. Claudia, I have a friend, I think, who would really like it here with you. Dr. Ravitch was correct. A Dallas Institute fellow and Cowan Council member and winner of the Institute's 2011 Height Prize in Humanities, Dr. Sinishaw and her rare wisdom have made an indelible mark on the Cowan Center's work. Please join me in welcoming her today. Thank you. So 
Today I'm going to argue that high school students benefit from reading philosophical texts. So I'm glad we're not here to locate the main idea. There wouldn't be much left to do if that were <laughs> the case. <laughs> um, to support this argument, I will cite not data, not, not learning results, but Plato's Republic itself. There's no way to argue this without actually looking into these texts, as Andy Del Banco explained. Uh, so beautifully earlier, the text demonstrates its own possibilities. And when taught well, it can bring dignity into the, to the individual and classroom. And what's dignity? It involves free will, humility, a sense of beauty. A classic philosophical treatise can inspire and exemplify all three. But the idea of assigning philosophical texts in high school classrooms and earlier is unpopular. I think in, in college, it's still understood that you're going to read books. Uh, in high school, you still ha you have to defend the idea. I'll, I'll explain the reasons why. But to defend the practice, one must show what it is. And I could have drawn on a number of texts. I chose the Republic because of its pertinence to this very topic. It's about the topic, really. I remember first reading Plato around age 13 and feeling as though I were listening to music that came from no instrument at all. At that age, I relished philosophical conversation, but Plato offered conversation of a different order. I read in English first and then a few years later in Greek. The reasoning seemed so clear and the questions so important, the dialogue so playful that I participated with my whole being. I'll tell a little anecdote. Uh, in college, I audited briefly a course of philosophy of feminism taught by a graduate student who, the up and coming feminist philosopher, extremely popular. I won't mention names because I don't want to misquote her, uh, but you may be able to guess. The, the lecture halls were packed. And I went to her one day after class and I said, I'm really enjoying your class, but I have a question. Now, I've been reading the feminist philosophers that you've been assigning. They're challenging me, they're interesting. Why is it that I still prefer to read Plato? And, <laughs> and she said, well, actually, I do too. <laughs> and she said, the problem is that some of the texts we're reading haven't had a chance to deepen. You know, the, the deepening comes with time. And that made a lot of sense to me. But whatever the reasons are, it's, it's there. It was an interesting conversation. Many years later, when I became a teacher of English as a second language, I had my students read Plato's Crito, and one seventh grade student said that went straight to my heart. And later, when I began teaching philosophy at Columbia Secondary School in Harlem, I created a curriculum filled with uh, philosophical and literary texts. And it took students a while to get used to this. They were used to debating current issues in class. That's how they perceived philosophy. So there was some resistance at first. But over time, they started taking to it and responding with enthusiasm. And one student wrote at the end of the year that she especially appreciated the texts that enraged her. She's a, a devout Muslim. She said she appreciated the texts that enraged her, such as Nietzsche's Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, because such texts forced her to define her own views more clearly. She came out of that with a clearer sense of who she was. So why then are high school students throughout the United States not introduced to philosophical literature? Why the frequent resistance, even where philosophy is offered, to dis discussion of actual texts? I find this resistance rooted in at least three assumptions, but three is a nice number. I gra gravitate toward it often, which I will challenge through reference to the Republic. And they are as follows. I'll summarize them first and then go into them a little more depth. Assumption one, students' own ideas are more important and liberating than the ideas to be found in books. Some argue that when you begin with the students and their ideas, you show them respect. In contrast, when you focus on texts, you send students the message that someone else's ideas are more important than their own. Given that everyone is a philosopher, this is both insulting and perilous, some will say. So start with the student. Uh, so assumption two, high school students are not intellectually ready for difficult texts. They should read material that they can grasp fully. Many districts and schools insist that each lesson have a clear, measurable objective and that students should have attained it by the lesson's end. Teachers often attend professional development sessions on setting SMART goals for each lesson, where SMART is an acronym for Specific, 
Yeah, I, I, I hear, laugh of recognition, I hear it. SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And so a philosophical text would break all of those bounds, I think, pretty quickly. Um, uh, assumption three, high school students need to tackle real-world problems that pertain to their own lives. Philosophical texts are too distant and esoteric. Uh, it is commonly believed that hands-on work and I mean, it's surprising, but there, there's a common assumption that hands-on real-life work is inherently superior to and separate from hands-off work, and that the more immediately useful the study, the better. In April 2013, the New York City Department of Education announced that under the Common Core, students would be working in teams to solve real-world problems. Now, that's fine. That's fine. There should, but, but there was not a single announcement or even a murmur that students would be also pondering imaginary problems on their own. So it's not, the attention to real, real world problems is not the problem, it's, that the, it's the lack of a counterbalance, the lack of a value placed on the use of imagination and um, the work in solitude. So what is the degree of truth of each of the assumptions uh, that I've mentioned so far? The, my point here is not to bash them, but to put them in their proper place. So I'll consider them in light of Plato's Republic, which examines the just city in order to understand and define the just soul. I teach parts of, parts of the Republic in a 10th grade ethics course and an 11th grade political philosophy course. And this year I'm giving students the opportunity to read it in full. I feel it's much more easily understood in full than in part. The Republic inquires into the nature of justice. After a long investigation, Plato, through Socrates and his companions, concludes that a just city is a well-ordered one, where the different parts do their work and where the deliberative part rules over the others, the spirited part and the appetitive part. So ruling over the appetites, but giving the appetites a place. Plato then draws an analogy between the city and the soul. In a just soul, the deliberative part again rules, but the spirited and appetitive parts do their work and contribute to the whole. And so see the second quote on your handout, which, which speaks to this. They're arranged in, order, uh, in the order that they appear in the text. So I'll read it aloud. One who is just does not allow any part of himself to do the work of another part or allow the various classes within him to meddle with each other. He regulates well what is really his own and rules himself. He puts himself in order, is his own friend, and harmonizes the three parts of himself like the three limiting notes in a musical scale, high, low, and middle. He binds together those parts and any others there may be in between, and from having been many things, he becomes entirely one, moderate and harmonious. Only then does he act. And this is remarkable taking into account Matthew Crawford's talk about our dis the dissipation of attention, how, how we disperse ourselves, you know, this idea of gathering the self into one. Only then does he act, and when he does anything, whether acquiring wealth, taking care of his body, engaging in politics, or in private contracts, in all of these, he believes that the action is just and fine that preserves this inner harmony and helps achieve it, and calls it so, and regards as wisdom the knowledge that oversees such actions. And he believes that the action that destroys this harmony is unjust and calls it so, and regards the belief that oversees it as arrogance. Not only does this make sense, but this speaks directly to what students need, to what students are seeking. And, it's, and it speaks in, such a, 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 in a way that does not dismiss or disparage the parts of us that crave, the parts of us that fight, but instead points to a way that those can also be brought together into a unified person, into a unified soul that makes good decisions. Okay. So from here, Plato demonstrates that the tyrannical soul is disordered, enslaved, poor, and wretched, since the deliberative part is enslaved by the lust for wealth or power, and that the deliberative or philosophical soul has the greatest justice and happiness. Now, this idea has complications and problems. Uh, it's not to be accepted as the final answer, as the ultimate truth. Should reason always rule the soul? My students read Praise of Folly by Erasmus. <laughs> There's, there are times when the reason must be let go. This is necessary and good. Is f the philosopher necessarily the best ruler? Maybe not always. I don't know. But let us consider the underlying principle 
of continually seeking the right proportions, not haphazardly, not clumsily, but with knowledge, discernment, and willingness to find oneself wrong. The greatest ill of education is willful distortion, skewing one's efforts, resources, and priorities, and then passing off the skew as necessary or good. The antidote to this is the striving for correct ratios and harmonies. But what are they, and where can, how can they be found? Are they particular to each person, or do they exist outside of us? When reading texts that grapple with these questions, Students move beyond the contemporary platitudes such as, it's all about balance. People love to say that it's all about balance. That tells us nothing. What is the balance? Where is it? They start to see how tricky and important the questions of proportion can be. They come to admire works that offer insight into the very investigation. My students enjoy making fun of Plato. It often seems to them that Socrates is doing all of the talking, or most of it, and that his companions agree with him a bit too readily even in book one, where Thrasymachus has his big outburst. Yet even when parodying Plato, my students take something valuable from the study. Here's an example from a piece one of my students wrote in 2012, and this is written as a continuation of book eight of Plato's Republic. And here Glaucon has the upper hand. Glaucon. Again, the middle and lower class would continue to petition for more prominence in the government, but the tyrant would continue to reject them. Socrates, precisely. <laughs> Glaucon. As a result of the rejections, the middle and lower classes would revolt, revolt in a desperate attempt to gain power. Socrates. Accurately stated. <laughs> Glaucon. And the, wait, Socrates, accurate to what? <laughs> Socrates. What is correct, of course. <laughs> Glaucon. Thank you, Socrates. I am flattered. <laughs> um, the very question, accurate to what? shows a keenness similar to Plato's. The response, what is correct, of course, is in keeping with Plato's view that there is an ultimate truth. The student not only picked up on subtleties of Plato's text, but just as subtly called them into question. So Plato's Republic offers a response to the very misconceptions or, or, or incomplete assumptions that keep it from being offered in schools. Plato's works and other works can awaken a longing in teachers and students alike, not for the days of ancient Greece, but for a calibrated and beautiful life. With Plato in mind, let's look again at the three assumptions I named earlier. So assumption number one, students' own ideas are more important and liberating than the ideas to be found in books. In the best of circumstances, and that's quite often, students bring curiosity, thoughtfulness, and ingenuity to their studies. Many educators worry that book study will destroy these virtues and capacities. If there is a subject, after all, in which students should think for themselves, it is philosophy. From the gist of the Republic, it seems that Plato himself would agree. After all, Socrates and the others pursue questions with only occasional reference to what has already been said or written. Wouldn't students then be following a Platonic tradition by having, uh, wouldn't schools be following a Platonic tradition by having students engage in dialogue on their own? So yes, students should certainly engage in dialogue, and, and plenty of it, but they need a glimpse of what this can be. In Plato's dialogue, Socrates and his companions are not easily distracted, uh, nor do they work in a void. Although it seems they're not working with texts, they know the philosophical work proceeding and surrounding them, and much of their work, much of their discussion is a response to that response to sophism, for instance. When reading Plato, students come to see what an extended dialogue with shape and direction can look and sound like. And the Republic is magnificent, the way it builds and the way it seems to digress, but the, the parts come together into a whole and still leave questions open. Just as in the Republic, Plato posits that musical training helps the soul distinguish good from bad, so dialogical training, in this case, reading of the Republic, can refine students' philosophical judgment and inspire their imagination. I've seen this not only in my students' homework and discussion, but in their philosophy journal, Contrarywise. And we don't have PowerPoints, but I will indulge in one visual display, which is, these are the two issues so far of the philosophy journal uh, that my students put out once a year, Contrarywise. It's beautiful. Uh, and I'll also remark, speaking of apprenticeship, that the founding editors-in-chief who graduated last year had the wisdom last year to, it was their idea, to take on apprentices and put them through initiation rites, but show them what it meant to be editors-in-chief, so that they would then take over this year, and then next year, these new editors-in-chief will take on apprentices. And what amazed me was that 
how well this worked, that this, the, the new editors-in-chief came in this year understanding what they were supposed to do in a way that they would not have, had they not been apprentices last year. It's a great idea. So let's take a look at the first quote that I selected. This is about how music, uh, it, musical training is actually training for exercise of good judgment in life. You know, something that musical training is fundamental to all education. Aren't these the reasons Glaucon, the education in music and poetry, is most important? First, because rhythm and harmony permeate the inner part of the soul more than anything else, affecting it more strongly and bringing it grace, so that if someone is properly educated in music and poetry, it makes him graceful. But if not, then the opposite. Second, because anyone who has been properly educated in music and poetry will sense it acutely when something has been omitted from a thing and when it hasn't been finely crafted or finely made by nature. And since he has the right distastes, he'll praise fine things, be pleased by them, receive them into his soul, and being nurtured by them become fine and good. He'll rightly object to what is shameful, hating it while he's still young and unable to grasp the reason, but having been educated in this way, he will welcome the reason when it comes and recognize it easily because of its kinship with himself. My students had many interesting responses to this passage. Uh, one student wrote about the hollow feeling in the stomach that he feels when he hears music that is out of tune or tempo and how, how one can f have that hollow feeling in response to other things as well, noticing that they aren't quite right. Another student remarked that this makes sense, that musical training would extend into all of life, because after all, we use musical metaphors everywhere. We talk about harmony, we talk about rhythm, in reference to many different things. So that we have that, that we already have a sense that music is part of everything. And a third made a curious observation that Plato doesn't bring up melody. And he said, I wondered, he mentions harmony and rhythm, and I wondered why he didn't bring up melody. He said, I think that's because Plato is, is moving toward the universal, and melody is very personal and individual, but rhythm and harmony are universal. And so <laughs> just some examples of what can come out of a reading like this. Um, it, it suggests to me that the text has not stifled my students. Let's now examine the second misconception. <laughs> High school students are not intellectually ready for difficult texts, including Plato's Republic. But that's true. Of course, high school students are not ready. Who is? Am I? No, I, I read it every year. I reread the, re -read the Republic every year if I can and find that I didn't understand everything. Must one be ready for a work in order to read it? Or is the unreadiness the very point? Some worry that students reading a difficult work prematurely may get frustrated, lose interest, fail to attain the course objectives, fail to demonstrate learning growth, and thereby affect the teacher's evaluations, and so on. And any of this can happen. It's true, it can happen. You can get frustrated, you can be overwhelmed by the difficulty of something, but the alternative is not to confine students to the comprehensible, the completely comprehensible. If students think that they must understand everything they read, then A, they will see no need to reread it once they do understand it. What, what more is there to read or understand? It's done. Finished, as one student used to say <laughs> uh, when he finished his homework. Finished. They, they will be deprived of books that challenge a reader over a lifetime. So they'll think they're done, and they also won't read things that are, that are not comprehensible right away. In contrast, if students come to see philosophical texts as works to be read and reread, if they accept that their initial understanding will be flawed and incomplete, then they can let themselves yearn for better understanding. And that's, that is taken up in quote three, which is important to the whole discussion here about liberal education. Then won't it be reasonable for us to plead in his defense, in the defense of the philosopher? So here, Socrates, Plato through Socrates, is defending the true philosopher uh, as opposed to the false philosopher that is often attacked by uh, those in his midst. That is the, near, the nature of the real lover of learning to struggle toward what is, not to remain with any of the many things that are believed to be, that as he moves on, he neither lo loses nor lessens his erotic love until he grasps the being of each nature itself with the part of his soul that is fitted to grasp it because of its kinship with it, and that once getting near what really is, 
and having intercourse with it and having begotten understanding and truth, he knows truly lives, is nourished, and at that point, but not before, is relieved from the pains of giving birth. As long as my interest has not been ruined when I tackle something, like a text, as long as I recognize that I have much more to learn, as long as I am moving towards such learning, does it matter that I don't understand much at the outset? What I do understand will press me toward more understanding. A skillful teacher can pose questions that open up more understanding. It is important, yes, to structure the instruction so that students are neither bewildered nor dependent on the teacher's summaries and interpretations. That's, this can be done, though. If students catch on to the spirit of unreadiness, if they approach a text as something to understand over time, then they will not only take on these texts but return to them. And so finally, we come to assumption number three. High school students need to tackle real world problems that pertain to their own lives. Philosophical texts are too distant and esoteric. Students are indeed preparing to enter the world, to hold a job, to raise families, and to manage the complexities of adult life. And they need to gain lots of knowledge in order to do this well. Yet how could a work like the Republic be deemed irrelevant to that? Take, for instance, Plato's call for censorship. At various places in the Republic, he argues that children should hear only the poetry that models strength of character and true ideas, not that which contains weaknesses or falsehood. Students can and will object vehemently to this, and well, they should, and that in itself attests to the relevance of the work. Yet it might also surprise them to see Plato's own doubts on the matter. It seems that he can't quite bear to give poetry up, or even the poetry that he finds weak or false, which seems to be most poetry. Homer and Sophocles and so on. He hopes that a par powerful argument in defense of poetry will be advanced. And this is the fourth quote. Nonetheless, says Socrates, if the poetry that aims at pleasure and imitation has any argument to bring forward that proves it ought to have a place in a well-governed city, we at least would be glad to admit it, for we are well aware of the charm it exercises. But be that as it may, to betray what one believes to be the truth is impious. What about you, Glaucon? Don't you feel the charm of the pleasure-giving muse, especially when you study her through the eyes of Homer? Uh, here, <laughs> students can see that Plato's argument, intricate and elaborate and seemingly complete, pushes beyond itself into new questions, that Plato has misgivings about what he has said about censorship. Students are taken into immediate, a question of immediate concern for them, question, questions of censorship. They experience it all the time, but then taken out of it, to a level of thought where certainties become uncertain and where there is hope for something greater and more complete. In this sense, the Republic as a whole can be read as an exemplar of education. I focused here on Plato for the sake of continuity, but many other philosophical works offer imaginative and noble ways of thinking. Students do not have to agree with them or apply them directly to their lives. Even disagreeing, even misunderstanding, even latching on to favorite or least favorite parts as we all do, they start to see a philosophical mind set to language, striving beyond its own limitations and composing a structure that for all its grandeur and beauty ends up serving something larger. Far from rendering students passive, these works awaken their minds, shake them out of cliches and relieve them of the burden of stiff-necked opinion. Much of our discord is trapped in opinion. I think this, you think that, we're all valid and alone with nothing to do but shout louder than the others. Schools have a duty to release students from this confinement, to show them the way from what they personally think to what they may still learn and understand. This may be the greatest dignity of all, to say, I don't know, and proceed from there. Thank you. Well, thank you both. I want to start where Larry began our last panel, asking you if you have any comments initially that you just want to reflect on about each other's talk, any question you want to ask before I dive in with my grocery list of things. Diane, I really liked your point about um, a genuinely philosophic text being kind of by its nature incomplete or pointing beyond itself 
leading to a kind of um, openness, uh, like aporia or something, and that that's, uh, for, for that very reason, inappropriate to school as, as conceived, um, uh, as widely conceived. In other words, that there has to be some, uh, some definite outcome that can, we can be accountable to. So that's, you've, I think you've really identified the problem there. Uh, but in other words, the tension between uh, liberal education and uh, the idea that this is uh, sort of a product that can be understood in the same way we understand other products as something definitive and, and finishable. So thanks for that. And I um, appreciated what you were saying about how trades can be uh, cognitively complex and, and involve exercise of subtle judgment, that it's not just learning how to put something together, but, but there, with a trade there, there are many, as with virtue, many more ways to miss the mark than to get it right. Yeah, and it requires a um, constant uh, kind of readiness to, uh, to think that your initial hypothesis may be wrong when you're diagnosing machines. So there's a kind of metacognition, as the cognitive scientists call it, of, of thinking critically about your own thinking. Because to get anchored and snap diagnostic judgments can be very costly, go down the wrong road. So I think that um, you know, be, always having in the back of the mind that you may be wrong is at once an intellectual virtue and a moral virtue. I think they're, they're intertwined in, in the ways that Aristotle teaches us. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, my, my first book was all about trying to um, kind of call into question this distinction between knowledge work and manual work as, the, as though they're two very different things. Um, so yeah. And you both refer specifically in your talks to submitting oneself to something larger than oneself in, in specific ways, overtly, and then also inferentially. Uh, you both talk about that. Um, I'd like for you all to discuss that a little bit more in light of some other things that I know that you have in common. Um, this, this notion of submission, as you pointed out, Diana, about it's not being about um, meeting the students where they are doesn't really necessarily need to translate into uh, teaching them what they already know and giving them the experiences that they already have. Um, but also learning how to submit to something which is not a very big thing that we have, except as you're talking about, Matthew, in our culture, we are constantly being programmed to submit to things but that's not what we're talking about here, being submitted to something larger than we are that's worth our time and attention. Can you all talk a little bit more about how important that notion of submission is in the project of learning? I know you've both touched on it, but if, if you could talk some more, that would be great. Well, well I think, yeah, that um, it's very, under, very difficult to think about education without thinking about about the idea of authority, um, the authority of, of teachers and texts, um, and texts, you know, to approach a text as though it may contain the truth that you vitally need in order to get a grip on how to live well. Um, that I mean, that's that's a horribly naive way to read a book. That that's the the, the beef against it, right? It's all I was just you know the voice of uh, benighted um, people from the past. Um, so in our regime, this isn't especially in a problem because we're, uh, well, Tocqueville said of the Americans that they're Cartesians without ever, ever having read Descartes, by which he meant that we, uh, we take it as an article of faith that one has to stand on one's own two feet and judge everything for yourself, arrive at your own judgments, and this is like the, the moral imperative for, for Americans. Um, and that, just right from the get-go, makes education a tricky matter, 
um, because it does require submitting uh, to teachers and approaching texts with um, w with a kind of um, a readiness to uh, to learn from them. Diana, yeah. did Submission is a tricky matter and easily misunderstood or mis the, it does not mean uh, shutting off questions or even shutting off judgments uh, that you are constantly as you go along you are struggling and that's the best thing that you can be doing you're struggling with what you're learning either struggling to learn it or struggling with what it is that you're learning and uh, the submission then is not the cessation of such struggle right. at all to the contrary it's the willingness to go into it and that's that's the part that people pe when people hear submission in this context they may mm -hmm. think that means just doing what the teacher says just reading this text without questioning at all no it's really to enter into the questioning willingly but questioning what's actually there in, in fact, if you've been flattered with the conceit that your own experience is, has, uh, kind of, is dispositive for you, it's yours, it's your experience, then it precludes such a struggle yeah. because there's no, um, you have to sort of get shaken from that a little bit in order to enter into that struggle. Because opinion ends the conversation. This yeah. is what I think, mm -hmm. this is what I know and it's mine and therefore yeah. it's valid. And right, so, and that closes mm -hmm. you off from any kind of confrontation with something outside yourself. I mean, that's, yeah. Go ahead, if you want. You also both make much of, um, in, in your books as well as, I, I, well maybe I read it into your talks so much, uh, the notion of solitude and the role that it plays in the development of the life of the mind. Um, the, I'm thinking, Matthew, of your um, apprenticing with the master, uh, learning the thing and then coming to know the thing, the mechanical thing itself, and then submitting yourself to that thing itself uh, in the community of the, the master, the master and apprentice. Um, Dinah, you talk wonderfully about the notion of coming to group work with nothing in hand, just let's turn and talk. We just said, we just made a concept, we presented something, now now discuss it at, at as deep as possible level. Uh, uh, yeah, something I don't approve of. So, so what is, how, how can you all talk about solitude in, in the way that it, it helps cultivate the life of the mind, um, what its place and role? I know that's a somewhat of a rhetorical question, but I want them to hear you all speaking what you think about the role of solitude? Uh, well, I'll begin by saying that I don't think of solitude only as, as physical removal. Uh, that one can uh, experience solitude or be aware of solitude during a conversation in, in a room with many others. It is, it's a, that uh, quality of independence of thought and mind or some, some capacity to be alone in, in any kind of situation. And that it, it exists in relation with dialogue and with and and so that a fruitful dialogue depends on some solitude because the person must be able to come to it with integrity having thought about the matter having having tested out what is true for himself or herself uh, to jump too quickly into talk without having had that thought at maybe not immediately beforehand and maybe not even about that topic, but without being in the practice of thinking about things, it will render the conversation shallow. But um, at the same time, the, the solitude without the dialogue can be, a, per, a person can wither under those conditions. One also needs the exchange with others. And it's, it's, it's difficult to explain. It often, often one gets emphasized over the other and, and it, neither exaggeration is fruitful. But again, finding the right proportion is difficult. Uh, the, the turn and talk activity that, that I, I criticize is uh, some, something is presented in this classroom and immediately the students are asked to turn and talk to each other about it. And the problem is they may not even, first they may not understand it yet, second they may not have thoughts about it yet, 
and so they may, and then they, third, they may be looking to the other rather than to themselves for an answer about what to think about this. And I've actually noticed that happen, that they will gravitate towards some common easy answer instead of thinking about themselves. Now, thinking for themselves. Now, if they were given time to think about this and write about it on their own, and then engage in dialogue with each other about it, that's an entirely different matter. But often that isn't what happens. It's the, the, the time is not made for, for thinking about the subject matter in the text. Yeah, as for solitude, um, one, one thing I've discovered is that left to my own devices, I'm really quite stupid. Um, <laughs> Because sometimes I'll go just trying to, you know, untie some intellectual knot for a few weeks, just, uh, you know, by my own devices. And then I'll go and read some book and realize what an idiot I've been. Um, so the solitude we're talking about is not navel gazing, right? It's um, solitary study means that you're uh, in dialogue with um, people that you have reason to think you're going to learn from, or, or, or you already know that. Um, so, yeah, solitude, I mean, it looks solitary because you're just sitting there, <laughs> but uh, um, and when, I'm, when I'm really humming, it's almost always, um, you know, I'm triangulating off of, of people who are a lot smarter than I am, and that's the only way I can learn. It reminds me of Don Cowan's passage at the beginning of the chapter in which he talks about education, liberal learning as being involving the communal ritual and dialogue, which brings the postulant to the informed consciousness of wisdom, he says, but that purposefulness of the communal ritual and dialogue that has to do with the solitary as well as with the individual. Um, one of the things that you both touched on was this notion of individuality. Um, and I think that goes back to my initial question about um, submission. Uh, Matthew, you said early in your talk that you really, or this was my paraphrase of it, um, that when you submit yourself to something larger, you're able to find yourself, which is kind of the opposite of the way that we have education set up at this point, which is to uh, continue down the path you're going or to continue studying and thinking about things that you know and enjoy and are familiar with. Um, where is individuality? Uh, you said this, Matthew, directly in your talk, um, that we're becoming homogenous because of this, uh, the way that we're over-advertising ourselves. Can you talk a little bit more about that and then we can talk about this difference between individuality and other? Well, I guess I'm Im impressed by the role that um, demanding studies play in forming a person. Um, and so the, the problem is just a very obvious one of um, if you have hyper palatable diversions that are available to you 24-7, even in your pocket, that uh, is just as a practical matter hard to um, devote yourself to those demanding studies. And the thing about the, the hyper palatable diversions is that they're mass in character, they're mass entertainments. So it just stands to reason that insofar as our mental energies are taken up with them, that we're becoming more similar to one another. Um, so it's, it's a worry about intellectual diversity um, and its fate in a, uh, in a culture where uh, life is increasingly saturated um, with experiences that have been designed to capture our attention. You know, the nature isn't, doesn't have that quality to it. I think that's one reason why going out for a, you know, a walk in, in nature can be so refreshing. You're not being addressed. You know, the birds, the rocks, the, you know, if you've been sitting on a log for only after 10 minutes, do you realize there's this beetle crawling there? Very unobtrusive, and it's that unobtrusiveness. Um, that's, that's the big contrast, I think. You're not being addressed, and that is so refreshing 
And similarly, a difficult text doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't uh, address you so assiduously as something that's designed to be, you know, at your level or something like that. So the, it is, 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 you know, somewhere between nature and, and TV, I guess. I don't know. I'm just talking out of my ass at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, what are your thoughts about the nature of... We'll leave that one and... Sorry. <laughs> between nature and TV. There was something to that, but I'm not... <laughs> about individuality and um, the intellectual life and the direction that we are heading in education or, or where we are in education. What's at stake here? What are we... Well, the, uh, uh, along the lines of what you're saying, the more we mass personalize things, tailor things to people's likes and tastes and this and that, the more we homogenize them. You know, that the people think they're able to set up their little Facebook pages according to their own personal this and that, and, um, and they, uh, they start looking the same and people start behaving the same way. And, posting updates about similar kinds of things, yet thinking that their updates are very uh, particular to them. And, um, and expressing even, even, even the like icon, uh, what a way of homogenizing an expression of appreciation. Uh, it's, it's to the point where the criticism of it has become a cliche. You know, we, all, we make fun of the, the like button, but it's, it's offensive. It's deeply offensive because I don't like to say that I like something. I, I, I'd like to say something a little more specific, specific than that, a little more substantial than that. Uh, so why should I be pushed into that? Um, and yet there's an illusion that with all these buttons and icons, you can make this your own special little space. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you, you, can, you can be you. And so there's a, a, a strange confusion about individuality. It's been twisted into the opposite, or what, what masks it, it, pretends to be individuality is actually some kind of um, some kind of push towards sameness. And so that genuine individuality actually involves something of of the opposite again. Instead of setting up our own little pages and our own little spaces and our own little updates, genuine individuality has a lot to do with listening to others, and that's, that's odd, but that's, that's my thought. And, and being, I think, uh, formed within some tradition, which I think it's a mistake to think of that as conformity. Um, if you're sort of formed in some tradition, whether it's a craft tradition or an intellectual tradition or a religious tradition, it gives you, uh, well, for one thing, it, it gives you something to rebel against, um, right? The, the Kierkegaard wrote this great book, a little book called On the Present Age, uh, On the Death of Rebellion. And he's saying that um, there's a kind of flattening of, of the human landscape under, um, you could call it egalitarianism, but it, it's more a kind of, um, it's, it's a, we're, we're embarrassed by rank and, and human difference, the kind that shows up as superiority and inferiority. And um, one reason that's, a, so one, let me give you a concrete example of this. So parents um, want to be their children's best friend, right? Which means you can't be too authoritarian um, the Kierkegaard's worry is that growing up with parents like that, you never kind of grow into yourself because there's, it's sort of like this claustrophobic kind of thing that you can't, you can't identify and, and reject. So it's a kind of smarmy, suffocating form of authority that's very hard to rebel against. But somehow, mm -hmm. how we had got on this, but the, just, I think it was prompted by, um, this idea that there's a lot of autonomy talk that, um, that, that flatters us um, into, uh, I think, a kind of a, a conformity. It speaks the language of individualism, um, but it seems to short circuit the development of, of the bona fide article.
of, of the real individual. The real individuality, which I think almost always develops within some uh, setting where you are uh, um, <coughs> answering to standards that are not your own. They're the standards of some practice or of some tradition. Um, and which is not to say that it's a, a, a dead tradition. It's, I mean, the tradition itself can be carried forward and, and improved by, uh, by those who are kind of struggling within it and against it at the same time. And it's always that way. But it's a touchstone out of oneself. Yeah. Well, we could go on, clearly. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave it at smarmy and <laughs> take our... <laughs> Thank you for introducing these words. Uh, we're going to take our lunch break now, and we'll be back here in an hour, at a uh, little more than an hour, at 1240. Uh, we are so pleased that we are going to have lunch by the Lincoln High School Culinary Arts School students. Uh, they are providing lunch, they and Mrs. Gaines. So if we go out into the main hallway, our staff will help direct you. You'll go to the right, and we're going to run counterclockwise around the big square that is the, the building. And so at the opposite end of this building is the, is the tiger's den where you will get your food. And then the cafeteria is on the other end of the hallway. So please make yourself at home, relax, have some more good conversation, and we'll see you in an hour.